Hey folks, thanks for joining us. Today we're going to look at a couple of cool new operators in the experimental builds of Touch Designer that are soon going to be rolling out into stable builds for all of your usage pleasures. So two of them that are really exciting for me are the Sprinkle Sop and the Jason Dat. So if we take a look at these really quickly, they're really fun because on one hand, the Sprinkle Sop makes something that was pretty difficult to do on your own, extremely easy to do. And the JSON DAT just makes it a bit more accessible for folks that are going to start working with web data and maybe they aren't super comfortable with their Python skills yet. And this can be a really good way to kind of bridge that gap between, you know, being comfortable to run through JSONs with Python and maybe you've just got some data that you need to get, you know, little bits and pieces out of. So if we start with the sprinkle SOP, this one is a really cool one because what it does is you can feed it a geometry and it's going to scatter points all along the outside mesh of that geometry. So for example, if we did a very, very, very simple example first, I'll make a rectangle SOP. And if I activate the viewer on my rectangle SOP and I right click on the background, go to display options, what I can do is click on either the points all or the point numbers here. And what that does is allows me to see inside of the viewer the points that I have here. And you can see I have zero, one, two, and three. So there's only four points in here. Now let's say I wanted to take this and kind of just have a random assortment of points appear in the middle. You could do something more fancy, like maybe get a grid SOP and then use some noise to kind of move those around. But that starts to create really complicated workflows for something that should be really easy. And that's where Sprinkle SOP comes in because what I can do is take my rectangle, plug it into Sprinkle SOP, Go over to the sprinkle stops parameters here and you can see I've got seed which basically just changes the seed that's used to sprinkle those numbers randomly. So if every time you wanted to show this on screen you wanted the points to be in a different place, all you have to do is just update that seed value. We can also see we have a message, a method for surface, per primitive, bounding boxes, volume. So there's a lot of depth to the sprinkle stop and how and where it actually sprinkles those points. I'm going to stick to surface because that's the easiest one that I think most people are probably going to use. And then our finally we have a number of points, which is a thousand. So we've gone from four points here, if I middle click on my rectangle SOP, to 1000 points that are just nicely, evenly distributed randomly across that surface. Now the cool thing about this is how easily it scales because we've been working with a rectangle. So what if, you know, I, I use a sphere SOP instead. Very similarly, I take my sphere plug it in, and I now have a nice random distribution of points all along the surface of that sphere. This even works with imported models, which I think is gonna be a place where a lot of people are gonna use this, especially when you know we've done projects where you import a model and you wanna have the connect able to you know distort the points, or maybe you're doing some generative processing on a model. And sometimes the models you get, the points are really heavily dense around curves, but then once it comes to straight lines or flat surfaces, you basically just get a couple of corner points. So this even works with that. So if I use an Alembic SOP in this case, for example, just because it comes with a Alembic file box already loaded in, I can plug that in. And just as easily as I did before, now I have a nice random assortment of points all across the surface of it. So I think this one is going to be a really cool one that a lot of people are going to like. I'm going to really enjoy using this. Um, I know before a lot of folks requested that this <laughs> get added because it is a, a operator inside of Houdini and there used to be some script SOP examples that you could use for this, but this really makes it native and easy to use. Now, another thing that is going to be really helpful for a lot of people, I think, is the JSON DAT. So inside of this text DAT here, I have just a sample JSON, which I've gotten from json.org forward slash example, and they have a nice little example here for you. But Let's say somebody gives you this and you needed to parse this. You know, if you're just getting started with Python and it's kind of like your first weeks at it, or even if you just want to do this really fast and not even, you know, invoke some Python scripts, before there wasn't really much option. You know, it, it was very difficult to do. Now we have something called the JSON DAT. And this DAT's whole purpose is to be able to traverse the JSON tree and return to you either the single result that you want or a list of results based on whatever you're looking for. Now this uses something called JSON path, which is a library and framework that kind of provides short codes for searching through JSON trees. 
And this is a standard thing in Python, so it's not specific, just a touch designer. If you go online and look up JSON path examples, you'll find lots of different tutorials that just teach JSON path kind of uh, expression making. But even on the actual derivative documentation as well, if you go to docs.derivative.ca forward slash JSON path, there's a nice little page here with a few examples. Now, if we dig into this in the quickest form, what we're going to see is the few workflows that are going to be really easy to use are one, finding a very specific piece of data, and two, kind of just trimming down and getting a piece of data that you don't know where it is. So if we start with our first example, you know, we have a JSON here and you still have to know a little bit about the JSON structure and how, you know, dictionaries work and how arrays work. But once you know a little bit about that, for example, if we wanted to get this title, we know that first we have to go into glossary and then we can get that title key. Now we'll see here by default, JSON path has this dollar sign and the dollar sign represents the root. So when you start with everything starts with a dollar sign. So in this case, either we can use two different kinds of expressions to get in there. First is going to look very similar to if you've done this in Python before, because what we can say is dollar sign, open a set of square brackets, and then go into glossary. And then you can see once we did that, the glossary little key disappears, because now essentially we're inside of that glossary dictionary. Now you can also do this with a kind of nicer expression format, I think, which is using dots. So you could say dollar sign dot glossary, and that gives us exactly the same thing. So now that we're inside glossary, if we want a title, rinse and repeat, you know, we say dot title. And just like that, we've got now example glossary, this title text in front of us. Now, a couple of tricks that I think a lot of people are probably going to use most of the time is that by default, the output is set to filter results. And the important part is the plural of results because what it's going to try and do is whatever filter you use with your JSON path, it may actually return more than one, you know, successful filtering, especially if you're working with bigger JSON pieces of, of data with lists and, you know, a, a single filter might actually return 10, 20, or even more items. Now, I think for a lot of people that are going to use this, they're probably just going to want to be able to target a specific data item within this tree. Like for example, here, we just want example glossary, the title. So what you can do is go to the output mode, switch it from filter results to first result. And then what you'll see is once we do that, the set of brackets, the square brackets that we had here disappear. Because remember before we were talking about multiple results being possible. So that made a list. And now we're just talking about a single result. Now, the final thing I like to do here is by default, this format output button is on. And that's why we can see the string markers because it's trying to be very Python correct for us. But for most people, I think what you're going to want is just this example glossary piece of text. So all you have to do is turn off format output. So now this is where, you know, you're starting to think about, wow, this is really useful because we went from this full JSON data structure with one operator and a couple of little kind of titles and keys inside of our JSON path expression. Now we have exactly in our dat format, the text that we wanted. So now there's a lot of tricks you can do with JSON path filters. I'm going to show you one more, which I think is really cool, which is the ability to search. Now let's go back to our root here. So I'm going to delete everything and I'm going to turn on the format output just because when it's formatted, it's a lot easier to read. So let's say, for example, we wanted to get this key here, gloss C. We wanted to get this and we have no idea where it is inside of the JSON tree hierarchy. We don't really want to go kind of spelunking for it. The really cool thing I can do in the JSON path filter is instead of using one dot, I can use two dots and the two dots are going to give me the ability to essentially search for whatever key I put next. So if I put two dots and then gloss C, just like that, we can see it got me the result, which is markup. And then just like before, now I can turn off format output. And with less than what looks like 20 characters, I've specifically marked and retrieved a element of this JSON, which this is going to be really useful because I think a lot of people who are going to use this, you know, maybe they're bringing in weather data or Twitter data or even just, you know, 
publicly accessible data. And a lot of the time, you'll probably want to just say, hey, you know what, go grab this piece of data, go grab today's temperature, or go grab, you know, the tweet text. And being able to do this so quickly with this JSON path filters, I think is going to be a really fun thing for folks. And especially once you start talking about scaling this up, and we're talking about social media data, that's where you may want to switch off of this first result back to filter results. Because then if you do something like dollar sign dot dot tweet text, then all of a sudden you would have a really beautiful list already organized with bam, 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 all those tweets right in there ready to go. So with that said, these are only a few of the really exciting features coming out in the experimental build. If you did want to play around with these and experiment with them, this is in the 44,000 plus builds. Uh, and I believe this is specifically 44,350. So that's where you can go to check it out. Enjoy. Hey folks, thanks for watching. If you're serious about learning touch designer and getting into our interactive and immersive industry, I highly recommend you check out the interactive and immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can click the link in the description to learn more about that. And if you like this video, hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and click on the little bell icon for more awesome free content.